Hey there, it's time for some new content. Isn't that right, mate? It is, yeah. Let's do it. Exciting times. Okay, so this is an idea myself and my new co-host Lucas, say hello Lucas. Hello. Um, came up with during the podcast that we do, and that is reading through dumb Wikipedia articles and riffing on them with booze and or fizzy water, because I'm over today. <laughs> We've been drinking for two days, so maybe just water this Maybe time. just water today, and the idea is it's just very funny to see just how matter-of-factly Wikipedia articles are written, especially when it comes to things that are like objectively quite humorous or interesting. So without further ado, let's talk about the Fire Festival. So we've not actually figured out how to work the format for this yet, so I'm just borrowing Lucas's phone. So <laughs> thank you for that, Lucas, and thank you for the background on your phone. Oh, yeah. Which is Donald Duck. It is, yeah. Whatever, anyway. And if people out there thinking, well, I don't know what the Fire Festival is, don't worry, we're going to cover that right now. Because uh, I'm going to be honest, this Wikipedia article just doesn't pull any fucking punches. Because <laughs> the literal first sentence of this article is, the Fire Festival was a fraudulent... Luxury Music Festival, founded by Billy McFarland, CEO of Fire Media Inc. and the rapper Ja Rule. <laughs> Why is because Ja Rule involved? Of course Ja Rule's involved. And created right? with the intent of promoting the company's Fire app for booking musical talent. The event was promoted heavily on Instagram by social media influencer, which is also in quotation marks, <laughs> which, yeah, I, I guess. I just like the insult there, social media influencer. Because wasn't it just like, Oh, the entire budget was just the social media. Oh marketing. yeah, because they got Kendall Jenner as well as models Bella Hadid and Emily Ratajkowski. Okay. Uh, who, as of about three days ago, fun facts are all being fucking sued oh, no. <laughs> because they were like promoting it and saying, "Come on, this nice music festival, it's going to be great." And then shenanigans ensued, as we're about oh. to discuss. The article continues during the Fire Festival's inaugural weekend. The event experienced problems related to security, food, accommodation, medical services, and artist relations. Essentially, fucking every aspect of the thing, resulting in the festival being postponed indefinitely. And this is where it starts to get really funny, because instead of the luxury villas and gourmet meals for which festival attendees paid thousands of dollars, they received pre-packaged sandwiches and FEMA tents as their accommodation. Oh god, so basically they the got invited into a homeless shelter. The kind of shit like hurricane victims get, holy yeah. shit. In March 2018, McFarland, you know the guy running the thing, pleaded guilty to one count of wire fraud to defraud investors and ticket holders, and a second count to defraud a ticket vendor that occurred while he was out on bail. So a standout guy all yeah. around, I think we can all agree. Totally. In October 2018, McFarland was sentenced to six years in prison and ordered to forfeit 26 million US dollars. The organisers became the subject of at least eight lawsuits, several of which were seeking class action status, and one seeking more than 100 million dollars in damages. Oh my the case God. accused the organisers of defrauding ticket buyers. And it talks about like there's a couple of documentaries. That's like that's the overview. That is the overview. That's the overview. So already. Not off to a great start for the Fire Festival. <laughs> but let's just delve into planning and organisation, shall we, Lucas? Oh, yeah. So, the top of it is just a picture of Billy McFarland and just Jarrell, just together. And then a plane <laughs> that features Fire Festival branding that was used to, like, you know, ferry people to the island of danger and mystery. <laughs> but here's a fact people might not know. During a flight to the Bahamas, McFarland and Jarrell's private plane touched down on a lightly populated island, which they later discovered was Norman's K the former private island of Carlos Ladera Rivas, a kingpin of the meddling cartel. Uh, McFarland arranged to lease the island from the current owner, so he leased an entire fucking island As under the strict condition that he make no reference to Pablo Escobar in any marketing materials. At the end of the day, that's like... They a rented... Good, it's a good way to start, isn't it? They rented a drug kingpin's island for this fucking thing. Oh, God. Oh, promotional footage with hired supermodels was shot on Norman's K and planned Planning for the festival went ahead in early 2017 after a promotional video was released on social media advertising Norman's K as once owned by Pablo Escobar. Oh, no. <laughs> they immediately went back on the promise. The one condition they had for renting the island, they went back on it immediately. Like, and you're probably thinking the owners of Norman's K were probably pretty pissed off about this. Well, they were because they immediately kicked him off the fucking island. He broke their one rule. And at which point, they had four months to find a new one before the festival started. Like, I think I work well under pressure. But if someone said, Carl, you've got four months to one, find a private island, and two, organise a massive music festival on it and like, get all the acts and accommodation sorted. 
Doesn't oh. it take four months just to set up a music festival? It takes more time. It takes that time to like clear all the artists yeah. and get everything abroad. Like, you've got to transfer stuff all the way across the fucking world. It's crazy. Like, <laughs> after several small islands that seem like likely venues were turned down, with two months to go before the fire festival, the Bahamanian government gave McFarlane to use a site set aside for development at Roker Point on Great Exuma, just north of the Sandals Resort. Uh, material released on social media continued to promote the falsehood that the festival was being hosted on Pablo Escobar's private island, with maps of the site altered to make it appear as, as if Roker Point, as if Roker Point was an island unto itself. So even the fucking <laughs> oh, posters no. were lying. In reality, they were in a remote parking lot north of Sandals Resort and a nearby marina where the locals would store their boats. <laughs> So we've gone from drug kingpins private island to fucking car park outside of SeaWorld. <laughs> McFarlane never announced the change. He just simply renamed the island to Fire K, which is apparently something you're allowed to do. And with no infrastructure and no villas, the team had just under two months to turn Roker's Point into Fire K. So they had two months to turn a parking lot into a private getaway island owned by a drug kingpin. <laughs> On December 12, 2016, Kendall Jenner, Emily Ratkowski and other influencers, that's not in quotation marks, but I'm going to pretend that it is because it's funnier, paid by Fire Festival simultaneously posted to their Instagram feeds a video with a thumbnail of an orange square and a logo made of stylized flames. Clicking on the thumbnail played the video showing Bella Hadid and other models represented by an agency running around a tropical beach. Text accompanying the video promised viewers an immersive music festival two transformative weekends on the boundaries of the impossible. This was be the beginning of the Fire Festival's promotional campaign. Oh, I like the idea that they got all the influencers in line to promote it a year and a half earlier, but they had two months to sort the fucking island out. <laughs> they got their priorities straight. Let's get Kendall Jenner and Emily Ratajkowski on board before we figure out where the fuck we're hosting this piece of shit. <laughs> With no experience staging an event at the proposed festival scale, McFarlane began approaching companies that did and was taken aback when they, when they informed him that an event of his scale would cost an approximate $50 million to stage in the time available as he had promised. <laughs> so he was given a $4 million loan, spent it all on a big office, said, oh, oh, how much could it possibly cost to turn a private island into like this massive, huge music festival? About $50 million. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, furthermore, the more experienced consultants told him that in addition to the cost, an event of this magnitude would have needed an extra year to plan. Yeah, no fucking shit. He and his associates at Fire believed it would cost far less and continue with the plans under, the, under that assumption. They tried to do things themselves where possible. McFarlane supposedly learned how to rent a stage by doing a Google search. <laughs> <laughs> this is supposed to be the biggest music festival on the planet, and he's fucking Googling it. Oh. How to make festival. It's like, oh god, no. Alright, so let's move swiftly on to festival events and attendee experiences. Because this, this is the best part. Early on the morning of April 27th, heavy rain fell on Great Exuma, which soaked the open tents and matches piled out in the open air for guest arrivals later that day. <laughs> so off to a rollicking good fucking start. That afternoon, Blink-182 announced that it was an withdrawing from the festival, stating in a Twitter post, we are not confident we would have what we need to give you the quality of performance we always give our fans. Initial arrivals were brought to an impromptu beach party, again in just quotes, at a beachside restaurant where they were applied with alcohol and kept waiting for around six hours while frantic preparations, it actually says frantic, for, at the festival site continued. McFarland had hired hundreds of local Bahamanian workers to help build the site. Meanwhile, organizers had to renegotiate the guarantees they offered to the people who would be playing at the festival as costs spiraled out of control. Late arrivals were brought directly to the grounds by a school bus where the true state of the festival site became apparent. Their accommodation were little more than scattered disaster relief tents with dirt floors, some mattresses that were soaking wet. The gourmet food accommodations were nothing more than inadequate and poor quality food, including cheese sandwiches served in foam containers. Like, just think of that, Lucas. I bet $12,000, like, Kendall Jenner's gonna be here. Kendall Jenner, like, she balls. When she was actually balls hard, oh, you yeah. arrive. Here's a cheese sandwich and a dirt floor. Have it. Although there were only about 500 people, there were not enough tents and beds for the guests, so they wound up stealing from others. So, just Mad Max happened. Like, I was gonna say, this is just Lord of the Flies, but with like really fucking rich Just kids. like Lord Humongous just appeared. Like, it's fucking amazing. 
Around 94, a group of local musicians took the stage and played for a few hours, the only act to perform at the event. In the early morning, it was announced that the festival would be postponed and that attendees would return to Miami as soon as possible. So mid-festival, they postpone a festival. They post and one act played. Unnamed, so they were apparently just local musicians who felt bad for everybody. Reports from the festival mentioned various other problems, such as mishandling or theft of luggage, baggage, no lighting to help people find their way around, an unfinished gravel lot, a lack of personal, uh, medical personnel or event staff, no cell phones or internet service, portable toilets, no running water, and heavy-handed security. These problems were exacerbated as the festival had been promoted as a cashless event, leaving many attendees without money for taxi fare or other expenses. Oh, no. <laughs> so they didn't have any money to just get a taxi and go home. They spent it all on the tickets. They did. They sent it on the ticket. Many attendees were reportedly left stranded as flights to and from the island were cancelled. <laughs> After the Bahamanian government, for no reason, issued an order that barred any planes from landing at the airport. <laughs> it's just, just Mad Max begins. Uh, the first flight back to Miami board at 1.30am on April 20th was delayed for hours due to issues of flight manifest. It was cancelled after sunrise and passengers were locked into the Exerma airport terminal with no access to food or water. Or air conditioning. I was going to say that, I've got to miss there. A passenger recalled at least one person that passed out from the heat and had to be hospitalised. One attendee who was stuck in Miami reported that the pilot of their airplane had told them to get off so they could turn the plane they were on into a rescue aircraft to get attendees off the island. So oh just, my god! This is like a fucking like rescue mission. Yeah. Like rescue these rich white kids and their iPhones. <laughs> Do you know what the best bit for me was though? I saw it all unfold live on Twitter and people started trolling the hashtag. So I freak people out by saying, oh man, has anyone noticed there's a lot of like feral, angry dogs roaming around the edge of camp? Oh no. Just saying shit like that. These poor kids with no food or water, and now they're just like, shit, there's feral dogs. <laughs> just there. checking Twitter and saying, oh yeah, my girlfriend went with some security guys an hour ago and she's not back yet. What do I do? Oh no. Just stuff like that. It's like, oh. <laughs> well, let's get to the aftermath. Ja Rule posted a note on Twitter that simply said, it was not a scam, and this is not my fault. Which is obviously things that a, you know, an innocent person posts on Twitter. That's the first this. thing I like to say when I'm innocent. It's just like, it, this is not a scam. It's not my fault. Uh, Fire Festival posted a statement on their website, which is a bit more like, you know, verbiose, a bit more um, uh, loquacious. Fire Festival's out to provide a once in a lifetime musical experience on the islands of Exumas. They fucking did that. <laughs> Due to circumstances out of our control, Really? They were warned by every expert in the field not to do it, but fine. Um, the physical infrastructure was not in place on time. We were unable to fulfill the vision safely and enjoyably for our guests. At this time, we are working tirelessly to get flights scheduled and get as people were still on the island as they posted this <laughs> and get everyone off Great Exuma and home safely and quickly as we can. We ask that the guests currently on island do not make their own arrangements to get to the airport as we're coordinating those plans. We are working to place everyone on complimentary charter back to Miami. This process commenced and the safety company, I guess, is our top priority. Clearly. It's like, <laughs> let's go sleep on the fucking dirt, you animal. Oh, oh but oh. the safety and comfort of our guests is our top priority. The festival is being postponed so we can further assess if and when we are able to create the high quality experience we envision. Just, we're really, really sorry that it all fucked up. We are idiots. Don't make your own plans. Oh wait, you can't because you've got no money. Yeah. Well, you, Sorry. Um, bit of, uh, right, we've got the next Nostradamus here because many news organisations compared the chaos to William Golding's novel, Lord of the Flies, and Suzanne Collins' novel, The Hunger Games. The Bahamas <laughs> Ministry of Tourism apologised on behalf of the nation and denied having any responsibility for how the events were. The entire fucking country had to apologise <laughs> for how shit. That's when you know you've fucked up. Yeah. You know you've fucked up when the entire country just says we're really sorry we had nothing to do with what we like they had nothing to do with it and they still felt fucking guilty for it but here's my favorite part fire festival announced that it would offer all attendees either a refund or vip tickets to the following year's festival i wonder which one people picked oh my god the thing is Can what you imagine? in the documentary that they made, i think there's two documentaries about it they reveal a story like one of the organizers was told oh there's no water you're gonna have to go suck a guy's dick and he was seriously contemplating whether or not you should go suck that dick to get water for the people. And it's like, oh my when God. you're put into that position, like, you need to reconsider like, your life choices. Like, what led you down that path? <laughs> oh my goodness. Was that a clusterfuck? Do you feel like you've learned something today, Lucas? 
I mean, I learned how to not put on a festival. No, you can just Google search it, mate. It's fine. Just, fine. It, Google, Google's your friend in this $4 regard. $4 million dollars in Google is all you need. <laughs> to put on a $50 million music. I love that fact. Oh, it, it'll cost you $50 million to organise that night. Well, well you, you, we're literally the people who do this. You've never done it before, and we have. This is how much it costs. Nah, it's fine. Ignore all the experts, Carl. Just gonna Google it. Google's the only expert <laughs> I need. But uh, yeah, I hope the people I hope enjoyed that ride too. And this is something we're trying to do, like, as the title suggests, on weekends. Uh, we've got a load of like dumb Wikipedia articles lined up that are just like fun to read through and riff on. And hopefully we'll be drinking in some of them, but not the ones we're recording today, because holy balls. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. But, yeah, thank you for watching. Check it out next time.